You know, Eddie, when I um, left my job teaching life skills at a community college and went off to Bible school, and my I was headed for 30, I figured that um, I would be single all of my life mm. and that I'd probably go somewhere like Africa or India as a missionary because this was the concept right. of giving your life to the Lord and right. and seeing you know him thrust you forth for his glory, leaving all to follow him. So it was with that that I went off to Bible school. Um, I took nothing except a suitcase of clothes and uh, you know that's I had no intention of marrying, but our marriage uh, was something that God spoke to me about and then spoke to you about that this was of Him. Right. And one of the things that was so real uh, as I would pray was that um, we would be crushed to powder. <laughs> and we say, when <laughs> We're does laughing that stop? because we feel like we have. <laughs> <laughs> when does that stop? <laughs> <laughs> we would be crushed to powder, but that the Holy Spirit would be poured over us and His work would go forth around the world. And I just felt that out of that compassion that we're, we're feeling for our friends, the family that we don't see right now, but we know we feel their presence, we know they're there, that uh, it was appropriate to share that because so many people uh, experience that um, crushing mm -hmm. um, you know and we don't like to talk about the hard things that Christians go through but you know when you give your life to the Lord the flesh has to die mm -hmm. yeah. yeah our victory is in the spirit our prosperity is in the spirit yeah mm -hmm. and when we go through the cross we don't st we don't um, we're not stuck at the cross but we do experience the cross in our lives. Mm -hmm. And as we come to the side f at some point where mm. we can experience the resurrection life, right. all of those things begin to uh, like come up like flowers in a garden, plants in a garden in our life. So let and, me switch it to you. And, and, and no, no, that's okay. Leave us both there because I, 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 I wasn't able to. Get okay. the cameras just right. And, and what you're talking about there, Sue, I just failed to read this, about death and resurrection. <laughs> and I think you, you call, you came up with the name, Two Deaths and a Resurrection. <laughs> oh, I don't know where I found that, but, you know, it's Paul says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And, and I think what Paul is talking about, you know, sometimes we interpret that to be this physical body. And yes, that, that is true. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And the context that Paul puts us in, he seems to expand this meaning to refer to this earthen vessel, this life uh, that we live on this earth, this life of challenges, this life of tests, trials, and challenges that we are faced with daily. Because listen to how he goes on. But we have this treasure. We have this wonderful treasure, but it's in this earthen vessel uh, of tests and trials and challenges. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not, not of us. It's all about God. That's right. That's it. Then he goes on. He says, we are, here is the vessel. He describes the vessel. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. <laughs> and, and the crushing he's talking about yeah, is where I, you're, I, I know. You're, you're, you're done away it's, with it. It's, you don't it's all exist. metaphors and metaphors, These are metaphors are not 100%. He says, we are perplexed. Paul didn't know what to do at times, oftentimes. He didn't know which way to turn. We are perplexed. You, ever didn't, you didn't know which way to turn? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Paul says we are perplexed, but we're not in despair. <laughs> in other words, we, we're not hopeless. That's right. We may not know which way to turn, but we're not without hope. But, 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 but we're not in despair. Persecuted. Persecuted. Probably we haven't been persecuted like Paul. There's more persecution that's already arising now in America and the world against people who are committed followers of Jesus and hold to a Christian worldview. Than ever before. Than in ever history. before. Yes. Persecuted but not forsaken. 
Not forsaken, not abandoned. Ever. Not abandoned. God ever. will, no matter what you're going through, remember God, you're not forsaken. God will never abandon you. You're his child. Persecuted, but not forsaken. When Paul was thrown in prison, beaten and thrown in prison, he knew he wasn't forsaken. When he was shipwrecked and floated on a piece of board to an island <laughs> out of the Mediterranean, he knew he wasn't forsaken. Whatever you're going through tonight, you're not forsaken. God has not abandoned you. Don't interpret whether God's with you or not by what you're going through tonight. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Which is in is Christ ours, Jesus our Lord. That is ours in Christ Jesus Somebody, Sue, our Lord. is needing this tonight. Yes, I know yes, it. Yes, I know it. Somebody know is needing it. this tonight. Right we didn't know we were going spirits. here. It's so real, so alive. Struck down, but not destroyed. I think it's the Living Bible. says it very vividly. Knocked down, but not knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> you ever been knocked down? <laughs> But because God is with you, you will never be knocked out. No TKOs. No TK, no, no, no knockouts. You, so you get up. You get knocked down, you get up, and you go on. I'm going to say that again. You get knocked down, you get up, and you go on. Listen to this. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life of Jesus also the, the essence of Christianity may be manifested in our body yep. the life of Jesus is that resurrection life and what Paul is saying hey we're in this world it's like we're continually facing death but it's so that the life the resurrection life of Jesus might be manifested in our body for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. That the life also of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. I want to tell you tonight, I'm talking to somebody that you feel like you're going through a terrible time. Let the life of Jesus, in this time, I believe with all of my heart, that the life of Jesus will be manifest. And I, and I was just thinking of an experience I had. I'll go ahead and share it. There, when Sue and I were in St. John, New Brunswick, and we were, ha we were having church, and there was a woman came to church, had two small children, a little girl probably about seven, and a boy, I don't know, about 11 or 12. And, she, she, uh, <coughs> and so I went over to visit her one day, and her husband had been away, but I guess he was home, well, had he not been in prison? I think, yeah, I think that's yeah, right. He had he'd, been, he'd in, been prison. in prison. Yeah. But he was in a drunken stupor. And, uh, and I could hear, she came to the door and she was obviously very embarrassed. And I could hear in the background in a drunken stupor saying, who's that? You know, that's coming going on. And she was very embarrassed. She stood at the door and talked a little bit. And, and so I, I left. But what I remember was how the kids, particularly the little boy, expressed to me how he was so excited his father was coming home. Oh, was wow. Getting out of prison. He was so excited about it. Oh. And, um, and then, it, and then they, they, they did come home, and they, they had some real issues in their marriage. And I remember she, wanted to, well, she asked if I'd be willing for them to come over and me talk to them. So I did. We sat at a table. And I remember he was a very angry person. In fact, he was, uh, I was told he was part of the Canadian crime syndicate, organized crime in Canada. But I remember he just got really angry, you know, and she was a very, she'd come across, she seemed very yeah. quiet and mild, and he just got angry, got up and had to walk around. He was so angry. But then it was just a few days later after that, yeah. I got a call from her yeah. that her husband had been found dead. He was hung from a belt and the, the police ruled it a suicide, she was sure that he had been murdered. Yeah. And so I needed to go, you know, so I asked, you know, well, where, where, you know, I needed to go. So uh, somehow I found out where to go to see her and the kids, and it, I guess it was at some of his relatives. But I remember I drove up and I got out, and I remember there's all these motorcycles parked around this house where it was. And, and I go up on the porch and there's these guys there, you know, they look like hell's angels, you know, long hair, tattoos all over them and everything. It looks like a hell's angels den. And I go in and I ask somebody about, uh, for, about this woman. Well, at first they didn't know who she was or anything. And so finally, oh, oh, uh, his, her, his wife. 
So they were in this house, a lot of people there, but they were in a room all by themselves. The, the, the mother and the two the, children? The mother and the two kids. Whoa. And so, you know, here, you know, this is a situation, you know, I don't know what to do. You know, what do you say to, to this woman and her two kids? You know, her husband, their father has just been... Especially the little fellow that was yeah, so excited yeah. that his dad was coming home. And, and so here, here I am facing death in, on so many different levels. Mm. Not just physical death, but on so many different levels. So, but I'm talking about the life of Jesus. We're facing yeah. death. We're continually facing death. But the life of Jesus will be manifested in the midst of whatever we're facing. And I remember I sat down and felt very helpless. But I sat down and I said a few words, you know, best I could of trying to comfort them. And then I said, well, let's pray. So, so the, the four of us, we bowed our heads. And all of a sudden, this lady, I didn't even know if she'd ever been baptized in the Spirit. I'd never heard her pray out loud or pray in tongues. Thing. But all of a sudden, up out of her innermost being, that life of Jesus began to flow. And she began to pray in other tongues. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. And there in the midst, surrounded by death, the life of Jesus came forth. And that room suddenly filled with peace. There was a subtleness. And there was a peace. And there was a presence of Jesus there. That's <laughs> what we're talking about. And in the midst of death, the life of Jesus came forth. Yeah. And somebody tonight, you're asking, well, why is all this happening to me? <laughs> why am I going through this? We have this treasure in earthen vessels. He didn't promise us a life on a bed of roses. In fact, he told his disciples, some of you, you're gonna, you're gonna be thrown out of the synagogues. You're gonna be thrown out of your churches. You're gonna, you're gonna be ostracized. Some of you, you will be put to death by people who think they're doing God's service by putting you to death. But in the midst of it all, he promised, I will never abandon you. I'll be with you. And expect that resurrection life of Jesus to be there in every situation. And, and I don't know how long she prayed, but I know that the peace and the presence of God came and settled in upon us. And there was supernatural comfort. And I knew the work had, did, had been done. And I left there with a, with a sense of accomplishment and peace because the life of Jesus had been manifested. Mm -hmm. And you have a treasure too. I have a treasure. Sue has a treasure. We all have a treasure. We have this treasure. It's in earthen vessels. And sometimes we must be careful that we don't get, our, get preoccupied with the earthen vessel. We don't get preoccupied with the things that we're going through, with the challenges, the tests, the trials, the tribulations. Paul couldn't afford to get preoccupied with the shipwrecks and the beatings and the jailings. <laughs> or he would have thrown in the town, town and gone back and said, you know, forget this. But no, but in the midst of all of those things, he saw the life of Jesus, the resurrection life of Jesus coming forth. And Eddie, that's what's kept us going. That's what's kept us going, You want to Sue. know, this is what it is to die and yet live in resurrection. Mm -hmm. This is what we're talking about. This is the essence of Christian relationships, of Christian marriage. This is what it is. In, in, in the midst, see, of whatever you're going through, let there be a dying to ego and self and a, and a consecration as never before to the Lord. Every time you're going through something, let there be more of a crucifixion of the I, the ego. And out of that, the resurrection life will be manifested and will come forth. That scripture that's behind you, you wanna, I think this is what you've been saying. Oh, I went the wrong way. Here. Okay, there. Isn't this what you've been talking about? I have been crucified with Christ, and I myself no longer live. Keep, keep going. But Christ lives in me. 
And the real life I now have within this body is a result of my trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now that's, see, that's the life we've been called to live. Could, could, could you back up, Sue, for a I'll moment? Do my best Let's look at that verse. I, that's the Living Bible. It's, it's very paraphrased, but it's good. I have been crucified with Christ, and I myself no longer live. The, the Greek word for I, that's translated I in Greek, the Greek is ego. Literally, Paul, in, 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 in when he was writing, he said an ego no longer lives. What he's saying is my I, my ego, is no longer the controlling factor in my life. My I, my ego, is no longer center. My I, my ego, has been replaced by Christ himself. And the life that I now live in the flesh or within this body, I'm, I'm going to quote the, the New King James, I live by faith in the Son of God. Literally in the Greek, it's in the genitive case that shows possession. He literally says, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, Paul says, it doesn't even say he lives by his own faith. He says, I live by the faith of. In other words, for Paul, he couldn't even brag about his faith. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He said, the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. <laughs> there was no I or ego there even to brag about his faith because he was living out of that life, that resurrection life that he's talking about here also in, in, in 2 Corinthians. This did not exempt him from troubles and, and challenges. Jesus said to me, in the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. That's what he said to his disciples. That's right, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Glory to God, glory to God. Praise you, Lord. It's a command, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The, the, I mean, it doesn't say, oh, life. you're not going to have any trouble anymore. You know, it's like, <laughs> guess what, guys? You're going to have some challenges. But you know what? Yeah. Jesus said, I'm in you and I've overcome the world. So be happy. So, 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 so never quit. Never stop. Never, never, never. Never quit. So much in life Keep is going. A Keep walking it out. Keep looking to Jesus. And every time you go through something like that, take it as an opportunity to die a little further to self-centeredness, to selfishness, to I, to ego. And to allow Christ to become more and more to fill your life. You know, Eddie, one of the practical points, uh, if uh, people have the notes, um, this is a very, very important, uh, let's see, this is really, really important. It's uh, probably under the practical pointers. Um, let's see, it's about not living by emotion not living i don't know where it went it's in there somewhere but the the principle the practical principle here is that we have to choose not to live by emotion yes. by feelings mm -hmm. it's like there was a, a, a younger person on facebook today and she happened to say um uh feeling down and i just normally i wouldn't bother but i felt to tell her that you know if you live by feelings it's like living on a roller coaster mm -hmm. yeah and one of the the things we have to do is choose to live by the facts mm -hmm. and even by logic rather <laughs> than by emotion i we we love the nba that's our hobby right now is watching the nba playoffs there was uh, hibbert i think his name is plays for uh, Indiana, the Indi Indiana Pacers. He's supposed to be one of their big stars, but he's like a roller coaster. And I, I looked at his face the other night when they called a foul on him, and he just looked so, like, negative emotions just filled him. It's like, hey, this is a basketball game. When you give it your all, you're going to do some bumping you maybe didn't mean to do, and you're going to get called for a foul. So take the foul, never mind getting down in the mully grubs and reacting negatively in your emotions. Stand yeah. up and get back in the game and play for your team, for heaven's sakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In life, I mean, 
friendships, relationships, and, and we're going to talk about marriage, but this it, is, it's the primary is relationship. This, no, this is it. But any relationship, this is true, but it's very intense in marriage. You can't live on emotions. And, uh, and, and, and I'll just elaborate on this a little bit. This and, is uh, important for, for all relationships, yeah. including marriage. Yeah. I, I, we were traveling through Canada, uh, I think, I don't know when it was, recently, some time ago. But anyway, I remember saying to you, I don't know if you remember it, I said to you, uh, I said, our marriage, our love is not like soda pop. I don't remember that. It, it, you don't remember it? No. Okay. It, it's, it, it's like wine. Now, I'm not a wine drinker, I, I'll, but, but here's the contrast. You know, soda pop, I do drink soda pop, Dr. Pepper. And uh, soda pop, when you open it and you, you pour it, you know, it's got this fizz and sparkle and everything. And, and it's got, I guess it's the carbonated water and it tastes good or I like it and everything. Dr. Pepper, fresh out of the bottle of the can. But if you <laughs> set it overnight, I have done this before, and I pour it out and it's flat. It doesn't sparkle, it doesn't fizz, it, it's flat. You take a drink, it tastes terrible, and so you just, I just pour it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's soda pop. <laughs> okay, I got it. Uh. Again, I'm not a wine drinker, but I understand that wine, the older it gets, the better it gets. It mellows and it deepens. And uh, whereas soda pop, it, it only lasts a day or two. <laughs> And the fizz is gone. <laughs> the taste is gone. Yeah. And I liken that, say, if, if you say a marriage, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, any you know, the first part of the marriage, though, you know, there is the... Lots of fizz. There's the fizz, the sex, the emotions, the feelings, the love and everything. And, and it's all there. There's the fizz and the foam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but after a while, it only lasts so long. And what is left then? But that's why I said I was comparing it to two kinds of drinks. Wine, they say, the older it gets, the better it gets. And I was trying to say to Sue, Sue, I, I feel like the older we get, the deeper and the better is our marriage and our love. Now, I remember one time in our marriage, it was one of the challenging times and there was a lot of pain. And I packed up and I had the car packed and I was And I leaving. was gonna help you. <laughs> I was gonna help you take your clothes. It was to the over. Car. <laughs> Are we glad we can laugh about it now? Yes. But we weren't laughing then. It was a very painful time but you know what because I, you know what we are both individuals mm -hmm, yeah. we will not back down <laughs> we are you know we're strong personalities mm -hmm, right, right. hey we have to be to be where we are to be doing what we're doing we would have been dead a long time ago if we weren't tough stuff so you know i don't become somebody else mm -hmm, right. just because i got married right, right. and you don't become somebody right. else so we have to knock God uses us to knock the rough edges off of one so, another, don't so, you think? Yeah. Yes, You didn't absolutely. have any rough edges, did you? No, I was a... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you had the rough edges. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we still have a few. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we haven't arrived. No, we're still growing. But anyway, growing. But, but we have made progress. <laughs> we made progress, and we're still growing. <laughs> but anyway, it, it, was, it was very painful, and I had packed up car I was ready to go and I decided well I'm gonna spend the night in prayer <laughs> chicken <laughs> so uh, no 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 listen I know I wasn't yeah. doing it trying to be spiritual it, it, it was it, desperation it, it, it was desperation it was pain and desperation <laughs> yes and um, so but 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 in a sense uh -huh. you look in the scripture before Jesus made very important decisions he, he spent some time in prayer before he chose the 12 that was going to carry on his work he spent you read this in the gospel Luke, jesus spent an entire night in prayer and then he went out and made these this very important decision he chose the people who would be the primary ones to carry on his work before he went to the cross he went to the garden of gethsemane 
And I would suggest anyone, before you make the very important decisions in life, come aside, whether it's an all-night or, or whether it's a few hours, find yourself a solitude in a quiet place where you can talk to God and you can think and you can pray and make the decision out of that. In other words, step away from the emotional... Step away from the situation. Step away from the emotionally driven negative The emotionally situation. charged situation. And get your adrenaline to stop pumping and just chill. Yes, that is so important. And think. Call a time out. Yeah, and think clearly. Call a time out. Yep. Uh, in basketball, they will often call a time out. Why? Because they need to come aside. They need to regroup. Yep. Don't ever make decisions in the middle of an emotionally charged situation. Never make final decisions in that kind of situation. Never, yeah. never. Never be driven. Call a time out. Never be driven. Come aside. Step away from it. Get away from the emotionally charged situation. Get away where you can have some quiet time away from it, some peace time, and you can talk to God, you can take your Bible, and you can read, and you can talk to God, and out of that time, then you can make decisions. But here's what I experienced that night. I experienced a real powerful visitation from God on, on, on several levels. Uh, not only was there this pain in our relationship, but we were drowning in debt. And I couldn't handle it. And it wasn't that we were living lavishly. No, we no, were, no. We were barely scraping by, yeah. and yet we were going behind. But here's what happened uh, in, in that. First of all, the first thing God spoke to me, and it was so clear, it was so powerful, was, I will never abandon you. Never because there's always you. the temptation when you go through a difficult time, there is always the temptation to say, where are you, God? Where, where is God? Yep. And, and, and here's... And, and, I, I had such a powerful assurance. I will never abandon you. And I knew that meant even, even if you carry out this, this decision you started to make, I, I'm not going to abandon you. And I want to say to somebody tonight, God has not abandoned you. No matter how, what life looks like, no matter what you're going through, God says to you, I will never abandon abandon you. That was the first thing I heard so clear. Boy, and that, that brought something down in my soul, down solid. in my heart. You're solid. This other thing, another, I don't know if they happen in this sequence. The other thing that happened was I suddenly had an understanding of what, it, what Jesus meant when he told his disciples to take up their cross and follow him. I had talked about that in the past. I had preached on it and sometimes, you know, you preach on things before you have really lived and walked it out. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh, just remember that <laughs> when you're listening to preachers. <laughs> yes. <coughs> but anyway, and I knew that, you know, a cross was a symbol of death. Mm -hmm. I mean, the disciples, they had seen crosses before. They were under the authority of Rome. They had seen people crucified. It, it, was, it was not a pretty sight. And that wasn't a pretty statement when Jesus said, if, you, if anyone will come after me, let him take up his cross. Him or her. Let him or her take up their cross and follow me. And see, it, now, now this is what it communicated in their minds. They had seen people carrying crosses. You remember Jesus had to carry his cross? That was typical. They had seen people carrying their cross. You saw a man carrying or a woman carrying a cross, probably mostly men in that, in that culture. That person was on their way to death. And so Jesus said, if anyone is going to come after me, let them, let them take up their cross and follow me. It's going to require a, a, a death to self and ego. And what I saw that night was, this is what God said to me very clearly. First thing was, I will never abandon you. The second thing was, to take up your cross and follow me means that you will always do the right thing, not the easy thing right. or the comfortable thing, yep. but the right thing. Mm -hmm. see, see, that was very relevant to me. The easy thing and the comfortable thing was to get out of the pain, to leave right there. <laughs> that was the easy thing, the comfortable thing. It's normal to but God said, from to pain. take up your cross, yeah. it means that you will always do the, the right, right thing, thing, 
Not the easy thing or the comfortable thing, but the right thing. And see, God is calling all of us. And that's what it means to take up your cross. Because the right thing, it will, bring, it will bring blessings eventually. But sometimes the right thing is not the immediate easy thing or the comfortable thing to do. But we must always do the right thing. And then the other thing, the third thing I experienced in that night of prayer, there was such a boldness that rose up in me about this financial debt we were facing. And it was such faith. It was not from me. It was not something I worked up because I quoted a bunch of scripture. It was that resurrection life of Jesus at work in me. And I, I felt like David going out against Goliath. You know, David went out with boldness. And I could hardly wait for, for the morning to come so that I could get on the phone and start calling these creditors and talking boldly to them. And out of that night of prayer, it was an incredible turning point. Hallelujah. And I, and, and, and I learned the importance. Again, God had spoken to me through this in the past, but, but in a new way, I learned the importance of, Sue called this two deaths in a resurrection, and I learned again what it meant to die to my ego and myself and to not live out of emotions and not to live out of pain, but to do the right thing. Not the easy thing, the comfortable thing, but to do the right thing. And I learned out of that the importance of, of calling a time out, not making decisions in the midst of an emotionally charged situation. Give yourself a break. Call time out. If somebody wants to see you and needs an answer, you know, you can say something like, you know, I can't be my best for you right now, and I want to give you my best. I want to give you the best answer, and I can't give that to you right now, so you're going to have to wait. You deserve the best I have to give you, and I can't give that to you. You're, you're, you're going to have to wait. You know, here's one thing that came out of that also was it had to do with taking control of my life. Not taking control of Sue's life or right. somebody else's life, but taking control yeah, of my th life. There it is. There it is for each of us. And, 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 and here was one thing that came to me, Sue, that night when, uh -huh. when this boldest, it was the resurrection life of Jesus rose up yep. in me yep. to begin to face the creditors. And I saw it like Jesus because, see, I was being intimidated, all these phone calls coming because mm -hmm. everything was behind. Mm -hmm. and, and I was intimidated by all of this, didn't know which way to turn, what to do. Mm -hmm. But this boldness of God rose up in me. And it was like Jesus when he was out in the wilderness and there were 5,000 men besides women and children, so probably fifteen to 20,000 people. They hadn't eaten in three days. They were hungry. And when people get hungry, they get irritable. They, they, and, and, and they can even become riots break out because people are hungry. But you know what Jesus did? You know, he told the disciples to make all the people sit down in rows. Mm -hmm. In other words, he took charge of the situation. He said, well, we're going to meet the need, but we're going to do it on my terms. And he made all the people sit down. Then he took the one little boy's lunch and he broke the bread, gave it to the disciples, and they distributed it. He met the need, but he didn't meet it on the people's terms. He met it on his terms. And this is what I was seeing. And this is how I approached the next day when I started getting on the phone. I will deal with this, but I'm not going to deal with it on your terms. You're going to have to work with me. Here's where I am, and I want to be faithful and discharge this debt, but you're going to have to work with me on, on my terms. I can't work with you on your terms. You're going to have to work with me. And you know what I found? They were willing. They were happy to, to do that. There was one debt of about $2,500. They immediately canceled half of it. <laughs> Others lowered the interest rates down to almost zero. Uh -huh. And I began to boldly confront these things and take control and say, you know, in a congenial manner, you know, I want to, I want to be faithful and deal with this, but you're going to have to work with me. We're going to have to do this on my terms. I begin to take control of my life. 
and not let other people and situations and circumstances control my life. Right. I begin to take control of my life. So some powerful lessons here. Don't make decisions in the midst of an emotionally charged can situation. You, can, oh, Take control of your life. Can you imagine if we had said, oh, we should go to a marriage council. <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I knew what they'd say. I knew the methods they would use. Mm. Oh, you've been wounded and oh, you must submit. And you know, you know the game. You know what mm -hmm. they're saying. And it's all off base. Mm -hmm. It's all on the wrong premises. Right. And so that's why in my notes, as I was thinking this through today, I said, one pointer, don't go to a marriage counselor. Hey, go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah. And go to the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. Uh, but you and see, spend a night in prayer. But see, <laughs> well, and, and I know, so you're not saying that you should never talk to friends, you know, or anything, or get feedback, or, no. or, 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 or sounding board, but, but, but what you're saying is you, you got to keep God, your relationship with Him, as your primary source of guidance and, and so I'm on. I'm saying that you sometimes can't we're too quick to go to, quote-unquote, counselors, professional, and friends, and so on. You didn't, that night, you didn't go to your best friend friends. I'm your best friend. And you were... You weren't that nice. Well, maybe I was. <laughs> maybe you were. You probably were. I yeah. was. Yeah, you probably were. <laughs> I was because look at, because I stood my ground. Look yeah. at the mm -hmm. wonderful outcome. Yes. Yeah. You changed that night because you had encounters with God. Yeah, Now, absolutely. had we, you know, had you gone to a marriage counselor, that it, would uh, not have happened. Oh, absolutely. You would have absolutely. become dependent. And absolutely. what the only one we're to be dependent upon is Jesus. Wow. Yeah. And we learn about relationships through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and especially in the, I want to stress this, the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. The last time we were in Sweden, we, I was asked to speak on what? Equality? Something uh, like that? Uh, lies the church tells women. Okay. You were asked to okay. speak on the lies you know, the church tells women. You know, and I sought God, and I, I, I just, as they say, I just couldn't get anything. But what kept coming to me was to go through the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it just, when I was willing to do that, it just really all came together. But it wasn't what they were expecting. But the answers are there. Yes. The answers are up for relationships, family relationships, friendships, mm -hmm. businesses, marriage. Yeah. For all of these relationships, the answers are in the Sermon on the Mount. Mm. It's very relational. Yeah. And it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's your marriage manual. Yeah, it's good. Sir. I also encourage people to read John Maxwell's book on the laws of teamwork. Mm. Because teamwork is what relationships are all about. We fit together with our giftings and our skills mm -hmm. yeah. to be, to, to, to synergize. And, and, and no two marriages are alike because no two people are alike. So, and, and that is very important to remember. Uh, there's one other scripture, Sue, that I, I'm, uh, but I don't want to interrupt if no, you were go, go in the flow it. there. Go for it. This is one thing that I felt was that I feel was very important that uh, I, I believe God gave to me. This was before we were married. It was when I knew that we were going to be married. And I was sitting in the floor, and uh, and I was talking to God, and I was saying God, I was saying to God, God, you're number one, you're number one. And I was saying this in relation to this relationship that I just come in with you, and I knew that we were probably going to get married. And so it was like I was assuring God that you would never take his place. And so I was saying to God, you're number one. You're number one. And I heard the Holy Spirit speak in my heart, I'm not in competition with anyone. Mm -hmm. And then, as I thought on this, it came to my mind, Romans eleven thirty six, 36, that says, For of him and through him, and to him are all things. And all of a sudden, I saw our relationship in a way that there was no room for there to be any competition with God. Of him, through him, and to him. And here, here's, here's what I believe God showed me. 
that our relationship, our marriage was of him. It was his idea. It wasn't my idea. It wasn't Sue's idea. It was his idea. And I'll, I'll have to say this. I have never doubted that. Even in some of the most difficult times, <laughs> I have never doubted that. It was so real. And God said, this is my idea. This is not your idea or Sue's idea. This is my idea. This, this is of me, of him. And then it's also through him. And what God was saying through that, it's going to be through me. This is of me, but it's going to be through me. In other words, you won't make it apart from me sustaining you. Right. You can't make it on your own. Uh -uh. You can read all the books in the world on marriage, but you won't make it except through me, except right. through trusting me. Right. Because this marriage is of me and it's also through me. And then the third one, it's to me, it's to him, of him, through him, and to him. In other words, what he meant by that was, I didn't bring you together just for you, just to make you happy. But you will experience happiness when you're in God's will. But your relationship is for me. It's for my glory. It's for my purpose. Of him, through him. To him. Hallelujah. Eddie, I want to keep broadening this. Okay. I want to keep broadening it out because this is not limited to the marriage relationship. No, this, this is what this I is, saw when yeah. I said that, that all relationships should be of him. That's right. Uh, in other words, we, we, we should be careful about building on our own initiative. Yeah relationships that are not of him because right. they can always be problematic that's right of him through him and to him of course we are a body right and and this is where you know i've talked here before about being rightly related go, go and properly it, related it. do it T tell it again would you please well this happened when you and i shortly after we married and we were involved with a church i was an associate pastor and so on and I was doing the Wednesday night service and doing some visitation for them. But then God called us to move on. And, um, but before he called us to move on, and, and, and these were good people there, uh, I began to feel very unsettled in this congregation and irritable. And every time I was in a service, everything irritated me. Their singing irritated, irritated me. Their praying irritated me. I left the, the service irritated. And I didn't want to be that way. That's not a Christian way to be. And I'd say, God, what is this? Is something wrong with me? Is something wrong with them? Lord, what is this? And the Lord showed me Elijah when he was down by the pool, the, I'm sorry, by the, the, the creek, Cherubeth, I think it was called, and God told him to go there to drink from the brook. It would refresh him and he'd send the ravens to feed him. But then it came time for him to move on. But before God spoke to him where to go, first of all, the brook dried up. There was no more water, no more refreshing, no more nourishment. And then after the brook dried up and, and he's feeling parched and thirsty, God says, I want you to go down here, Elijah. Well, as I'm seeking God about this, I heard God say, there's nothing wrong with you and there's nothing wrong with them. But as far as you are concerned, the brook has dried up in this place. There's no more refreshing for you here because I have called you to move on in the next phase that I've called you to. And then out of that, I begin to see something about the body of Christ, you know, that has many members where Paul talks about this. And in the body, and I begin to see that there's a difference in being rightly related and properly related. If I had stayed in that congregation trying to be rightly related with him and straining, trying to have a right attitude and being rightly related, I don't know what would have happened because I wasn't properly related. I was trying to have a close relationship with him and God was telling me, no, I, I want you to be over here. So basically, when we moved on, and actually that was when we started a congregation, I didn't feel irritated towards those people anymore. They even loaned us chairs, took up an offering for us when we went out. And once time the pastor was gone and they asked me to come over and fill in for him while he was gone. And so we had a good relationship with those people, but it was no longer a close relationship. And in the body, these five fingers have a very close relationship 
They do things together many times every day. The toes on my foot, they're also a part of the body. But they have a distant relationship with these five fingers. They hardly ever get together for fellowship. <laughs> Don't take that any further, okay? We won't take it any further. But they're saying the part of the body. And what I saw was it's important that we be properly related, that we be with the people that God wants us to be with. Doesn't mean we won't have challenges. 38 years ago, I was joined up with the woman I was supposed to be with. That didn't mean it was going to be a life of bliss from there on out. We've had our challenges along the way, but we knew God had put us together. And so even in all kinds of relationships of life, I think what, where you wanted to expand it, Sue, was we need to have this sense. We need to have this sense inside. And know, you know, I believe God's hooking me up with these people. I believe God wants me to be related to these people. You know, I think God wants me to be related to Eddie and Sue. I think God wants me to pray for them. You know, maybe God, I, I think maybe God wants me to, to support them financially. You know, whatever it might be, you know, it, it's important that our lives be of Him, through Him and to Him. And that's what I saw that day when God said, uh, I'm not in competition with anybody. This is of me, it's through me and to me. And all of your life, all of your relationships are to be like this. It's there to be of me. They're to be through me and to me. There's and I'm sure we've all, along the way, we've made mistakes in relationships. But hey, that, that is the goal. Yeah, we're still growing. And we're still growing. That's what we aspire to. Eddie, I wanted to look at number three. We're running out of time now. It's okay, yeah. But yeah, we need to just, wrap this I up. I think this is a very important principle of uh, marriage and of all human relationships. Okay. Number three, walk in the light mm -hmm. as yeah. he is in the light. 1 John 1, 7. Right. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The importance of walking in the light in order to have fellowship with one another. Right. And the, another word that expresses that as synonym would be communicate. Right. And... I mean, there's a whole message. Sure. There's a whole book. Right. How to communicate? How to how to talk and relate to to one another? Um, doing it with integrity. Um, speaking the truth in love. In love. Right. Speaking the truth in love. Right. There's there can be a big difference. Yes. Between speaking the truth, it's important to add that little prepositional phrase, oh, in love. Yeah, that, that is so important. It keeps it in the, the spirit. Otherwise, truth can harden people. Oh, it's, truth it's not is spoken by the spirit and in love. Badness. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. There you yeah. go. Um, and I put down there, if you don't know how, for heaven's sakes, learn, mm. because it's critical. I remember on one occasion that uh, we were headed on a mission to the Northeast, and uh, God kept saying, it's going to be so important that you and Eddie walk in the light with one another. Mm. And I would tell you that we've got to walk in the light here. I don't know what this is all about. But it turned out that the people, the person that we were related to in that situation was not one who walked in the light, mm. but who walked in the shadows. Right, right. And it just about, just the the environment of mm. deception yeah. and not walking in the light mm -hmm. yeah. almost destroyed us yeah. and everything we had. Yeah. Yeah. But see, when God says something to to us like, yeah. walk in the light, yeah. it's like, well, God, talk to me about that, would you? Mm. What do you mean by that? Yeah. What does that mean in this situation? Right. But it was, you know, it was a, we either learn or we, <laughs> we suffer because we didn't learn. But we learned, But we yes. learned, and that's still a very important principle in having healthy relationships, no matter how close or how distant. Right. Walk in the light. Yes, And you'll yes, have yes. fellowship with one another. 
Okay, so well, we're, have we we're, 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 covered enough? We, we covered quite a bit here, Sue, and uh, I, I, I suspect people maybe have comments. If, this, if you have found this helpful, boy, I, I, sent, I have sensed God very powerfully speaking, I believe, to people tonight, Sue. Uh, maybe we should just pray for healing for people. Maybe there are some marriages that need healing. Maybe, maybe there are some other kinds of relationships that need healing. Maybe there's somebody watching that maybe you haven't walked in the light and you need to come out into the open in some area. But let's just pray right now for healing. Let, that, let the healing flow. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to share with people and friends, probably some people we've never met, never seen, never talked to before, our own tonight. Lord, I just pray that your healing presence will flow. Lord, where there is strain, where there is dissension in any marriages, Lord, I pray that there will be a melting by your resurrection life and spirit. Let there be a melting and a flowing together. May hearts flow together as one in your love, in your presence, Lord. Thank you for a mighty flow of your presence and healing tonight. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, touch each person where they hurt, Lord. I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Out up close relationships yes. is that we can confront one another. Right, yeah. And this brings me to what I would ask you to share uh, from one of the Jewish commentaries about the wife is not... The, the Jewish commentaries don't tell a wife to come under the domination of a man. Right, right. It does tell women to confront. Confront. Right. Confront. Now, there's a, there's a life skill. Mm -hmm. How to confront And that's someone. not a negative thing. It doesn't no. have to be. Now, it can no. be. Oh. But, but, but we should, all Christians should be able to confront one, one of, another. It's important in every... Right. It's important in all kinds of relationships. In healthy relationships, there has to be that freedom and yeah. that ability to confront right. out of love. Yeah. Oh, you know, and you get these... Whenever I get this from somebody, I kind of go, Oh, I love you, but let me tell you something about <laughs> yourself. Oh, and be blessed. You know, they sandwich what they really want to say in between that. That's not right. spirit-led confrontation. Confrontation is being able just to really... Just really mm -hmm. walk in the light with yeah, each other. Yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't yeah, have to be... Yeah, that's a part of be, walking in the light. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a negative crisis. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But, you know, when you come through that kind of sharing, mm -hmm. there's a lifting. Yeah. There's a peace. Yeah, that, that's true. There is. Yeah. And, and usually, it's over the years when we've had to Sometimes it can be... It, sometimes, let me finish. Oh, okay. When we've yeah. had to confront, we get hungry. Yeah. And we say, you know what? I... It's a breakthrough. It, it's a breakthrough. And so, sometimes it's like, it's like a thunderstorm with lightning and rain, and then all of a sudden it's gone. It's the blue skies, the sun yeah. comes out. Yeah. yeah, and that's what happened yesterday, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. And we came into this studio, yeah. remember? Uh -huh. And we did four, four programs. programs. Yeah, and it was good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you might be, because some people may not have been on in the beginning, yeah. would you just real quick tell them why? The set is like it is? Uh, yes. That's uh, a theme, Revive America, for the weekly broadcast that I'm doing for Channel 99 in Paris, Texas. But we believe that it's going to expand out from there. And I do post it on my YouTube channel. And uh, Sue came up with this idea. We've been trying to keep the GWTW logo, and so we were calling it GWTW, God's Word to the World. Uh, but this past week, Sue said... I feel like you should call it Revive America. Well, that resonated in my heart because I have a deep concern about this country right now, and I know the only hope is not another election, not another president. The only hope is another great spiritual awakening. And this Revive America, it's not about promoting America because I know God doesn't have any favorites. He loves Canadians. He loves our Irish friends. He loves our British friends and our Indian friends, wherever you may be. He loves you just as much as he does Americans. God doesn't have any ethnic favorites. I'll say that again. God does not have any ethnic favorites. But we should be patriotic in a godly way for the people and the place where we are at the moment. 
And so I hope that you all, even our friends in Ireland, Canada, and England, I hope you will join me and we pray for you all and you will pray with us for a great spiritual awakening in America. It, it is a very, very critical time. This is not the country I grew up in and it's changing for the worse right now more quickly than I have ever seen it. And so um, we believe, I mean, there just came a focus and a stirring in me when Sue came up with this new name. So, so we're believing that God's going to use it in a very powerful way. And that brings me to this. Uh, this, it, is, uh, this is not for the U.S. alone. This is for every nation. This is, this is for every nation. But I want to uh, tell Sue, uh, this, my new book, Pursuing Power, I walked into the office of a president of a college where I used to teach. And he was the other day, just a few days ago, because Kitbach, our friend Kitbach, also graduated there, and he wanted to go see him. So we walked into the office, and lo and behold, he was reading Pursuing Power. And he said, I'm not only reading, I'm underlining. He says, this is very relative for a real challenge that we have been facing here. Wow. Um, I gave the, the book to a provost of a college where I used to teach. He's a former provost. And he was so excited about it. He's been sharing it with friends. And he's a part of the Four Square denomination, which is one of the largest Pentecostal denominations with millions of adherents all over the world, churches all over the world. And he sent it to an acquaintance of his who's a vice president in this organization at their headquarters. And he just sent me an email today. He said, Eddie, I got an email, thank you, from Dr. So-and-so. And he said, he thanked me for the book, Pursuing Power, and he said, it's so relative. He said, I am having a meeting with leaders of the Four Square Church in South America and, and where they're dealing with this whole thing of wanting to set up an apostolic order and government. And he said, this book came just in time. It is so relative for this meeting I have tomorrow with the leaders of our denomination in South America. Well, wow. And then today, just this evening, you had an email uh, from a friend in Canada wanting to buy it in, by the box. A Christian yeah. leader in Canada, just when we came, just shortly before we came on the air, saying, you know, how can I buy this book in in, in, in bulk, how many comes in a box? What kind of price will you give me? And so, so this book is starting to get some traction. Would you pray for this book that God will use it, spread it all over the world and use it? Uh, Sue wants me to share about this. Lord, thank you for this book. It, it's on time. It's very timely. This is a word I keep hearing from people say that it's, it's timely. If you don't have it, it's on Amazon and also on our website. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I shared this in the first First session. Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation. Those of you in the prayer room, feel free to pray. Feel free to talk. Feel free to comment. It's okay. We're, we're through teaching in a sense, and I'm just, we're just kind of interacting and talking now. But this is a very powerful scripture. This is for Canada. This is for Ireland. This is for India. This is for Indonesia. This is for Nepal. Don and Phoebe, this is for Nepal. And this is where you and I come in. What is it? Psalm 33? What? Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is. And in this psalm, David is not saying, blessed is the nation who believes there is a God, or blessed is that nation who believes there is a higher power. But he's very specific. Blessed is that nation whose God is a very specific God. Now let me tell you about these two words, God and Lord. The word God is a translation of the Hebrew word Elohim, which is a generic word for deity. Blessed is a nation whose Elohim, a generic word for deity that was used by all of the nations around Israel. The Canaanites had their Elohim. The, the Jebusites and the Hittites, they all had their Elohim. It's a generic word for a higher power, for a deity. But blessed is that nation whose Elohim is, and the word Lord there, you'll see it's all capitals. The Hebrew word is Yahweh. Our King James says Jehovah. But Yahweh was the personal name of God. That was the name that God used when he related personally to his own people. It's the personal name of God. 
Yahweh. And so there in the Old Testament context, it was blessed is the nation not who believe in a higher power because all the nations believed in gods and higher powers. But blessed is the nation whose Elohim is Yahweh. Now how does that apply to us in the New Testament? The name Yahweh is actually derived from the simple Hebrew verb to be, like the English I am. And God revealed himself to this in the burning bush when he spoke to Moses. He appeared to Moses in the desert in the burning bush and, and was commissioning him, instructing him to go down to Egypt to bring out his people from Egypt's bondage. And Moses said, well, when I go, who will I tell them? When they say, well, who sent you? What will I tell them? And the voice from the burning bush says, I am that I am. Tell them that I am has sent you. The simple Hebrew verb to be translated by the English I am. And it's really a very profound thing because it's saying that God is, is this transcendent one that dwells in eternity, no beginning, no end. The transcendent one that the most profound thing we can say about him, he is the I am. In the New Testament, Jesus revealed himself as the I am. He identified himself with the God that spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. This is John chapter 8, around verses 51, 52. He was talking to some of the Jews. And he said to them, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And they said, You're not even 50 years old, and you're telling us you've seen Abraham? Because Abraham lived about 1,900 years prior to this, to the time that Jesus was on earth. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And in that statement, he identified himself with Yahweh of the Old Testament. And that's why the Jews then took up stones to stone him for blasphemy. But there are so many I am statements there in John. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and life. I am the good shepherd. And so we could say, we could take this, and this is for America, for Canada, for Ireland. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord Jesus Christ. And boy, what I was showing on these programs and quoting from the founders of America, their trust in Jesus, their belief in Jesus, and it was even so clear to me how America has moved so far away from its beginnings. And we can no longer say blessed is the nation whose God is specifically the Lord Jesus Christ. Not blessed is the nation who believes in a higher power. Not blessed is the nation who believes there is a God. Very specifically, blessed is the nation whose God is. Not Allah. Not Buddha. Not Krishna. And not a combination of these, but whose Elohim, whose God is. Yahweh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well. Wow. Glory to God. So folks, we need revival in America. We need revival in Canada, Ireland, England, the nations of the earth. Oh God, use us. Use the people that's part of this streaming family. Use us, oh God, in this hour, in this critical hour. Use us, oh God, to bring forth your truth in love by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, so this, and the, and the this, prayer room is, is growing in number. Really? Yeah, there's 15 in there now. Andrea uh, Fern came on from up in Canada, and Andrea just came on from Costa Rica. And somebody, Ibtara, do I, I know I-B-T-A-R-A? Ta Tara? Tyra? I-B-T-A-R-A is, is the name in the prayer room. God bless you. So glad you're with us tonight. Lord, we just thank you tonight. If anybody has a comment, if you've been blessed tonight, if you have been helped, would you please let us know? And our friend Margaret, Margaret, what a blessing and what a God-given friend you and Sean, friends you and Sean are. She says, thanks, Eddie and Sue, what a powerful teaching. It seems to me none of this living is possible without the help of the Holy Spirit. 
living life his way. <laughs> Thank you for being so honest about your own marriage. I am learning lots. We will have to watch the archive version. God bless you. Fondest love, Margaret. Thank you, Margaret, in Belenisloe, Ireland. And we want to Thank congratulate you, Jesus. them. Yes. Sean went off to Ireland very early this morning to receive the award for the number one hospice in all of Europe. Wow. He, it uh, must be every three years that they give it. And he and his Galway hospice won this first place award three years ago, and they repeat it again this year. This is amazing. Yes, yes, because amen. <coughs> it's blessed, it's blessed. Steve says, great teaching. It was so good to hear Sue share and laugh. And, and Michelle in Spokane says, I have been very blessed. Thank you both so much. And Fern says, Eddie, when the Holy Spirit moves, there will be persecution. But take heart, anyone finding that? I think she didn't finish her sentence. Be glorified. Be glorified. Sing with me. This is, uh, this is our desire. Be glorified. Be glorified. Sing it, be glorified. Oh, be glorified. And be glorified. Lord, be Be glorified in the heavens. Be glorified in the heavens. Be glorified in the earth. Be glorified in your temple. Jesus. Jesus. Be thou glorified. I'm going to move that up just a little bit lower. Take it off. Be glorified. And be glorified. That's better for my voice. Oh, be glorified. And be glorified in the heaven be glorified in the earth be glorified in your temple Jesus Jesus be thou glorified May he be glorified in all of our lives. May he be glorified in all of our marriages. And I'm talking to a lot of single people. May he be glorified in you as a single person and in all your friendships and relationships. In all that we do, may he be glorified because it's really all about him. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Andrea, I posted your prayer request earlier in the, in the prayer room the best that I could, but if you want to post it again, feel free to do so. Absolutely. Um, if there were some way to together pray about that without it being um, rude, <coughs> um, you know, many who are out there will understand that when there is divorce, it's painful. And I think that we should pray yes. for that. Now, yeah. Uh, Andrea's parents have divorced and they, they have to go to a hearing about distributing or dividing or selling the assets. And so this is a very painful time for Andrea and her brother. So, uh, and uh, she's concerned about her father. She, she asked for prayer that his heart will be softened. And uh, so pray for strength for Andrea, her brother and her mother, and for her father that his heart will be softened. 
and, and that God will be glorified through it all in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray with Andrea. We agree with her right now, Lord. We pray, Lord, that your presence, your love will, will, will envelop her and her family in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we'll give you all of the praise for it. We give you all of the honor in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm really blessed by, by Andrea, too. Um, I don't know if the people out there know that she is translating 50 pages of In the Spirit, We're Equal. Yeah, that's right. Um, as uh, she has to, tr for her degree, to, for her thesis, she has to translate 100 pages from English into Spanish. And so they're allowing her to take 50 pages from my book and 50 pages from, I think, a secular book. And to, that will be her thesis, which means that that part of In the Spirit We're Equal will have top quality translation. That is amazing. This, this girl, she is amazing. And then when she finishes this, she's going to complete the translation of In the Spirit We're Equal. She's already done it with 10 things Jesus said about women. And uh, we want to get that translated into Spanish as soon as possible. Um, wow to distribute throughout Latin America. And, and those of you in the prayer room, if you have a, Andrea has just posted that request, and if you have a prayer in your heart, would you just feel free, just be bold and feel free to go ahead and post what's in your heart oh, there? And, and Andrea was very tired last night from the work. It's, you know, it's, I know I've translated Greek and Hebrew and German and blah, blah, blah. It's a lot of work. So could we just ask God's blessing that he would strengthen her yes. and help her at this time in this way too, that he would that she would be so energized and this would be easy. Yes, let's do that. Because he's in it. Lord, we bring our friend Andrea down in Costa Rica to you right now, Lord, and we thank you for bringing her into our lives and the blessing she is and this translation work she's doing. And Lord, I, we, we ask you right now, Lord, that you will strengthen her, refresh her with your presence. And Lord, like we were talking earlier, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And in the midst of what Andrea is going through right now, this difficult time, Lord, I pray that she will experience the resurrection life of Jesus flowing forth uh, out of her, into her, and, and through her in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for strength and refreshing and healing in Andrea and her family now, this night, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And do a miracle in her father's heart yeah. that indeed he would just, just like that woman whose husband uh, was killed or committed suicide that you told, you spoke of at the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that there would be such an infusion yes. of the Spirit of God in that yeah. man Amen. that he will never be the same. Yeah, yeah, amen. Unto, unto thee, O Lord. I'm going to put my capo back on again. Unto thee, O Lord. Do I lift up my soul unto Thee, O Lord? Do I lift up my soul, O oh my God? I trust in Thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me show me thy way show me thy way thy ways O oh Lord teach me thy paths thy paths O oh Lord and oh my God I trust in thee let me not be ashamed, let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yes, unto thee, O Lord, 
do I lift up my soul and unto thee, O Lord. Do I lift up my soul and, O oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed, let not mine enemies triumph over me. Right out of the Psalms, David's cry this heart, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. And I lift up my soul for all of our friends, the ones I see here in the prayer room, ones I don't see, but you're there, you see us on the camera. Oh, I pray tonight, I pray tonight that as you look to Him, no matter what you're going through, that as you look up to Him, as Paul said, you will experience that life of Jesus flowing out, bringing healing, refreshing, bringing the answer, bringing the resolution that is needed for whatever your situation is, whatever you're going through. Lord, I ask you to bless my brothers and my sisters that are tuned in tonight. Thank you for healing and refreshing them and assuring them you will never abandon them. And assuring them, Lord, you will see them through. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we praise you, O oh God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to your name. I'm going to go over and I'm in the prayer room. I'm going to go over and just check my email. Sometimes people. Oh, there's our friend Ildi in Pensacola. God bless Ildi and Jolt. What a blessing you both are. And she says, hi, thank you for sharing your life's experience today. She says, Eddie, I enjoyed when you said the Holy Spirit is not in competition with anybody. And, uh, and then she says, P.S., happy birthday and happy anniversary. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, your birthday's tomorrow. Say happy birthday to yourself. <laughs> happy birthday to me. <laughs> happy birthday to me. Birthday's tomorrow. Anniversary is Saturday. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God has been good, Sue. We've, we've been through some things, but God has been good. God, this is one thing I can say, folks. God has been faithful. Yes. He has seen us through. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. For all that you've done, I will thank all that you're going to do he's not finished with any of us yet the fact that we're still here on this earth means god's not finished with us yet he still has plans for you he still has plans for us he has plans for this streaming all that you promised and all that you are it's all that has carried me and Jesus, I thank you. Sing it with me. For all that you've done, I will thank you. For all that you're going to do. For all that you promised and all that you are. It's all that has carried me through, and Jesus, I thank.